you much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And um, I think what I'd like to do is start by saying how many of you are from the West Midlands? Oh, oh, yeah. We've got a few. That's what I'd like to see. So um, for some of you, you may or may not know about the West Midlands and the strengths of the West Midlands. And certainly one of the things that we're trying to do as an academic health science network is sort of to bring inward investment into the region and to ensure that we can develop innovation from an idea all the way through to adoption in order to improve health and wealth. So in the West Midlands we have 51 NHS organisations with over 126,000 healthcare professionals delivering that healthcare that, that's going on importantly across the patch. It's a £94 billion economy with 130,000 organisations that are supporting that with their national, global, international companies. And about 50% of the UK's population can be reached within a two hour drive from the West Midlands. And if you wanted 98% of the UK's population, then you'd only have to drive for about three and a half hours. And equally, we've got an airport, thankfully, which has a couple of runways, but have been extended so that we can now have the big Airbus that can come and see us regularly. Um, but it also reaches across to Asia, um, east and west coast of the US, etc. And so it's about, we are centrally the best place to organise yourself and to place your business. And I'm, I am here to promote the West Midlands because I am from the West Midlands. So. I fully believe in it. We also have 13 higher education institutions and the second largest uh, medical school based there. And we have the largest number of clinical trials that go on across the country. So I don't know how many of you heard of academic health science networks, but there are 15 of us across the country, across England. And we're licensed by NHS England. And our real raison d'etre is to promote the adoption of innovation. And therefore, it's, it's innovations which are proven. They've already been adopted somewhere else, whether that's within healthcare or within other, other industries. And it's about ensuring that what we can do is allow patients, the public, and the population of the West Midlands to benefit from those innovations. And again, we focus on a health and wealth. Wealth sometimes within the NHS scares people. We don't like to use the W word because that means profit, doesn't it? Well, actually, no. If we can support people with long-term conditions to remain in work longer and to be more productive employees, then actually that's going to support the region and the, the economics of the region itself. So that's what the 15 HSNs are there for. We are the one in the West Midlands. And essentially, what I'm here to talk to you about is what we've done about open innovation and how we're trying to approach it. Because for those of you that don't know, there's a, there's a term which is called the scissors of doom, and that's a basically where there's a £20 billion deficit heading towards the NHS um, by 2020, and looking at how do we deliver more, because everybody's ageing well, and we're getting older, and therefore that we have more longer-term conditions and more comorbidities to have to deal with. How do we deal with that within, um, a, a, unfortunately, a pot of money that isn't growing, but it's decreasing? So we decided that our approach was going to be looking at how we get the adoption of innovations sped up, essentially. We need to build our awareness of what's out there, and we need to sort of build a culture of innovation. And it's been really interesting listening to the speeches this morning about how within global organisations you develop um, a culture of innovation. Well, actually, our challenge is how do we deliver that for... 18 acute trusts for 22 clinical commissioning groups for 10 community and mental health providers for all of these GP surgeries and local community pharmacies how do we get them all involved in innovation and also looking at how they can work more collaboratively together so we've got a bit of a challenge and so one of the things that we decided to do was not only do we have physical networks that work together to look at this under specific headers, so instead of trying to boil the ocean, we've been clear about what our priorities are, but we've also said we need a digital presence as well, and it was interesting hearing about the digital environment that we want to bring. And so what we've done is developed a platform, along with Q Markets, and being a public procuring organisation, so we are hosted by one of the largest trusts in the region, we had to go through a public procurement process. 
And the first things that we did was to try and put together in our specification, well, what is it that we need? Now, obviously, we're serving a population of 5.6 million people and all of those health professionals that are working within that. So we needed to make sure that it was something that was accessible, it was usable, it was, it was flexible. You know, it needed to cross all of our stakeholders. So we support not only the health industries, but the higher education, the industry, third sector, anybody that's involved in delivering, improving health and delivering wealth, then essentially that's who our customer was. So um, we started off with a very broad specification and then said, actually, we probably need to be a bit specific about what it is that we need. Um, but ultimately, it was flexibility. It was flexibility to be able to see things from different perspectives and to allow us to say to our customers, this is everything that's going on and this is how you're able to, to, to get engaged essentially. Now, my background is I was a head of transformation within an acute trust, so I, I kind of understood the clinical world, but I didn't understand sort of the, the digital and the technical capabilities that were out there. So it, it, was, um, it was a really tricky sort of start to begin with to go, right, let's put it down on paper what we need. And, and I'll be honest, it did take us a good couple of months to refine it and to get people involved and, and to engage with others to go, have we covered everything that we need to cover off and have we missed anything? So essentially these were the things that we were looking for and we had a this is what it must do and then this is what a this would be nice to have it just for some future proofing of what it is that we need to deliver how can we ensure that it that it does everything that we need to so as i've mentioned we already we went through um, an oju process which was painful in itself but we, we got there in the end <laughs> we're here now um, I, we are a hosted organisation and so I was working with the procurement team within an acute trust. Now they're very used to procuring medical devices, bits of kit, but try and talk to them about something that was actually new, innovative, hadn't really been done before, um, had, certainly hadn't been done on a regional scale before and they looked a bit perplexed. So again that took a bit of time to work through and to get us to that point. However, once we got to the stage where we began contracting, then it was a lot easier and we could sort of understand how people would work on a framework basis. And I must say that what we've done, and, and you'll see later, is we haven't just procured a, um, a platform. What we have done is embedded it within an innovation and adoption service so that there are um, industry-facing elements to it, as well as um, MidTech, who are a company that look at how you protect the IP that comes out of the NHS, essentially. So when we decided to get going, obviously we engaged with the multiple stakeholders and we had an advisory group that had essentially, hopefully, advised us on the right way to go forward, but from each of our key stakeholders groups. So we had SMEs, um, industry, large pharma and medtech industry um, present, presented at the, um, at the advisory group along with healthcare, innovation leads, um, research and development leads as well, because I think it's interesting how R&D and innovation do mix in that you know, you've got some that are very commercially aware of how to get trials into the system but then not necessarily aware of how to innovate from that. Um, we had some really tough discussions about what this platform was there to deliver and the fact that it did need people to share and people's reluctance to share and there's a, there was a lack of trust and it's how do we start to build that trust with people. And again, we've come from a very competitive background, and so we need to start moving towards a position of collaboration and how that can be the way forward, rather than saying everything must go to this tertiary acute centre, rather than actually there's an element where everybody can work together and benefit from this. So finally, we were able to develop Meridian, which is what we've called our health innovation exchange. Um, working with Q Markets along with um, GE Finamore and Pilot Light Ventures that helps us to essentially design the full process from, from end to end. And what I wanted to do was share some detail of what is live now. So we launched on the 1st of March. So again, it's in its infancy. So you talk about where we are in our journey. And, and we're at really the start of this journey and understanding how we can grow this capability and capacity um, to collaborate with others and to bring people from different sectors in to identify what some of the challenges are that we're facing as a healthcare system. And I think that's been one of the things that um, 
has been sort of over the past couple of years that we've been established, before we'd go out and we'd try to push innovation out there. So we'd be aware of everything that was going on and then we'd go to our colleagues in the health economy and say, what do you think of these innovations? And it wasn't landing. So we decided to do sort of a, a 180 really and turn it on its head and start saying, okay, let's, let's ignore what all these innovations are coming in, not necessarily ignore, but let's find what your pain points are, what are your needs, what are the issues that you're facing, and so the sort of the, the campaigns or the challenges, which is language that's really quite, um, people within the creative sectors are quite au okay fait with what a challenge or a campaign is, but within the health sector they've found this, again, a whole new language that we've got to try and talk to them about. But also, it's a language that we need to get across all of the sectors so that they can start to say, okay, let's unpick what some of your challenges are because then we know that there's a whole wealth of information, of industry out there that can come in and support and co-create almost with you if there isn't a solution that's already out there. A lot of the time we've found that the innovation is out there and what they can do is just submit their innovation against the campaigns that we're put in. And then it's about us trying to crowdsource, okay, that's great. Um, and you can see this is, again, the detail that you can put behind the innovation pull campaigns to go, this is what we're looking for and this is what we need. And then there's an innovator himself putting forward his submission. And again, what we can do is we can start to say, okay, well, I can tag it. I can tag it against our themes and priorities so I can make sure that, again, the relevance, and I know from Talis who talked about the stage gates that we went through. So we've been able to, to put some very clear gates in here about, okay, um, the innovator knows where he's at in the process as well. As a, as a small core team, what we found that we were dealing with a lot of people that had innovations and were going, how am I getting on? Where am I going? You know, is there any interest? At least with this, they can see where their innovation is through the process. Um, and then they're able to put in descriptions, detail, further detail, and they can upload relevant market research that they've done, they can upload case studies, they can even upload videos. So again, it's about, instead of having to clog up somebody's inbox, because we all know that we're syncing with emails, it allows you to go to one place to access all of the information and to download it in your own time and to think about, okay, how might that be relevant to us? The other thing that's useful and this is Sally, who's um, the commercial director for a local SME in, in the West Midlands, is if she's got something of interest and I'm looking at that and I want to follow the submission and what she's been doing, then I can literally click on the star and it will give me regular updates to suit me. So it can be hourly, it can be daily, it can be weekly, or it can be monthly so that you can stay on top of, OK, what discussions have happened around that? Has anybody taken it on board and adopted it? or? Actually, I want to email that to one of my colleagues and it will email the whole submission then to somebody else in the link. Um, I can PDF it, so if it was something that somebody prefers a paper copy, I can at least print it for them. Or I can contact the author myself and have a chat with her directly. And I think that's the other thing, it's about making some of these people accessible. Um, and having a photo gives them a face so that you're not going, well, I don't know who that is that's contacting me, so I'm going to ignore their email. They start to have a presence, and it, it seems a lot more personal than it has been before. So this is where, on, on the main homepage, you can see the innovations that have recently been submitted, and this is about how we start to generate that conversation, where we start people to see that there are opportunities to work with other types of companies and to see what activity is going on across the patch. Some of the times it's just about igniting a conversation with somebody to go, do you know what, I hadn't even thought of that before. And even the lighting, I've realised I'm a bit of a geek now because we'd had conversations with a hospital where they'd spent three million pounds in implementing RFID. Well, actually, how much would the lighting cost to replace that in order to deliver the same benefits that they're seeing, the same outcomes? And it starts to go, this is how we trigger the conversations. That's what we need is that cross-collaboration. So now I want a conversation with the lightning man, who isn't boring, because I can see how that can deliver real patient deliverable outcomes. Because if you know where a patient is, you can then manage the flow. And patient flow within a hospital is one of the biggest challenges that we're all facing from A&E through to discharge. So if there's a way of mapping that, then I think you're going to be my man. Um, so again, this is just highlights the kind of discussions that we can have, and it, it's all real time. And 
we're really excited by the, the, the interest that this can give us and, you know, the, the power of these conversations that before I was instigating meetings, you know, and it's like, I don't need to do that anymore. They can just get on with it themselves and, you know, relinquish that control. You know, as, as a network, we are there to facilitate these conversations. And I think the biggest challenge that we've had to go overcome is to give people within the healthcare profession the permission to just get on with it. And I think it, it's so sad that we have to stand in front of them and go, yep, you've got permission to be innovative. We don't need to do that anymore. You know, we can put it on there, put it out there, and they can go, well, I can, I can respond to that challenge. I know what I can do. Um, and so it is there for everybody. And again, we've got an opportunity to share stories where it's worked, they've had it adopted. You know, we want the hospitals within the region and, and the GP surgeries to promote what they're really good at. And I think it was interesting, somebody said earlier on, what do we mean by innovation? And for us, it's anything that's delivering a better outcome than what you're doing today. And it's how we can get people to overcome the, well, I don't really know what innovation is, and get them to just be involved, basically. So again, we've put some gamification in there because we liked it and we thought it would get them back to the site. Um, and we're going to get their face up there. So we've got our first award ceremony in June. And how would we have gathered that information before? I've no idea, but now we can do that. And again, this is me talking to an orthopaedic surgeon about how he can get involved. And, and, you know, he's starting to get excited because before he was limited as to the audience he could take his innovations to. So this is a service that we've delivered, as I've said, it's not just a platform, it's a service as well, and there's people that sit behind it. And one of the biggest things that we can put on the platform is news. So one of the things that excites um, our university colleagues is what grants are out there? How can I find funding that will support my research? And actually, um, we've got a lovely lady who does a really funny email out every Friday to talk about what funding opportunities there are and we can just literally shift and lift everything that she's got on there, we can talk about our awards, we can talk about the new companies that have come to the region and, and are we aware of what capabilities they have. The other thing that we've embedded is a sharp cloud tool that looks at how do we make an interactive tool for downloading um, our adoption journey, so practical tools, advice, this is the um, adoption process. This is where we can give you support around having um, an adoption proposition template. All of it, again, embedded from the site, as you can see. And essentially, it's about creating that virtuous circle. So how do we get more people to and from the site in order to build that collaboration and that um, conversation, basically? Um, we're early doors, but that's, that's our end goal. And in order to create these outcomes, and I think that's the bit that we're really passionate about, is we want to see deliverables out of this. This isn't a nice to have. This is, we need this in order to deliver better health care for tomorrow. And we've already mentioned ROI. Well, I've got a different one, and this is my return on involvement, because until people get involved, you're not going to get any return. And so I've, I've stolen this with pride, because I think that's what we need to be doing now moving forwards. And I think our biggest challenge moving ahead is how we get over people's fear of change. And I think it's about working with them to go, it's OK, you can deliver this and more by accepting a bit more change, basically. So now I'd like to hand over to Michael, who's going to talk more about Q Markets itself. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Um, we're, just let me say I'm incredibly proud and uh, thankful for being aligned to uh, what Lucy and her team are doing so wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> I uh, will only take uh, two, three minutes uh, uh, to give you the chance maybe to also have some uh, questions for Lucy. So um, when it comes to open innovation, the mindset of many people is like this. Um, and when you look at uh, a, a possible open innovation project, you will uh, realize that this is something um, uh, very true. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I personally have made up my mind uh, about innovation. Uh, I found my best innovation already here. You can see that um, I challenge anyone to, uh, to top that innovation. 
Um, but uh, talking more about you know, uh, uh, open innovation, I want to give you five uh, top scares and to five to, uh, uh, best practices very quickly. Um, as you know, we're a software vendor. The, the bad part of that is that we want to come and sell you software licenses. The good part is we get a high level overview of so many organizations, what they do and what they struggle with in, in, in open innovation. Um, the one, uh, so, so talking to over 200 customers implementing their innovation systems, the top five scares are um, damage the brand, uh, to, to their brand, um, creating a complaint box rather than an open innovation site. How, how, you know, uh, how do you manage that you actually get and receive ideas and how you, th that you receive um, positive uh, uh, input rather than uh, people complaining, okay? Uh, the number three is um, <clears throat> many are afraid, especially in the B2B, that customers are synchronizing um, and starting to compare pricing, uh, starting to compare uh, service levels. So that's, uh, that's a really big scare. Um, less so in B2C, very a lot in B, uh, B2B. Um, then anything of uh, legal matters re regarding the IP, what, what, you know, let's not get into any IP mess. Um, Let's avoid uh, any, any problems when we actually get a good idea. Uh, and then number five is lack of uh, participation. Uh, you know, we were just uh, mentioning the return of involvement again. Um, those are the five uh, big scares um, uh, from, from what we've seen. And now um, <clears throat> just very quickly, the uh, five best practices we have seen in a, in a, with, with, those, with that same group of of, of customers um, include social media. Don't just put up a, a website um, uh, somewhere, but, but uh, involve your Facebook followers, your LinkedIn followers, uh, uh, whatever. So um, include social media, include suppliers, academia, customers on various levels, uh, not just one group, uh, not just exclusively, um, have a high recognition of your open innovation internally. There's nothing better than to have a proud employee uh, to go and say, well, oh, have you seen this? This is, this is us. Yeah? The, they don't even show the company website anymore, but they show uh, the open innovation uh, initiative because that's what, have you seen us on Facebook? Have you seen, so your, your employees can carry the, uh, uh, can really carry the, the uh, open innovation. So get them excited about it, get, get them involved in it. Um, offer brand related incentives. What this means, if you are a business that sells chocolates, don't offer airplane tickets. So, so uh, uh, do something they can relate to your uh, brand offer incentives. We all know incentives, reward, recognition is incredibly important for participation. Um, offer something that goes along with your with your brand, with your with your core market, with your core offering, and don't kill it legally straight away. We uh, we dealt with a um, large, fast-moving consumer good company, a wonderful company. <clears throat> But uh, uh, and they were running a, a challenge for 500,000 of their Facebook followers, um, wanting to know what is the next um, microwave dinner for teenagers. And um, uh, what they did is before they even welcomed anyone to the site, before they even uh, had anyone be able to submit an idea, they put a legal disclaimer there and you had to accept, you had to basically sign your life away, your, your future, your children, your grandchildren, everything. And, and that um, <clears throat> stopped it. They had 500,000 people involved and four ideas. Uh, and the reason for that was uh, everybody we talked to afterwards, because we were obviously in shock ourselves, there was uh, such a low outcome was um, the legal disclaimer, which then was a change. And after that, this uh, became a great success. <clears throat> um, just two, three words on Q Markets. Uh, we have a whole suite of products 
uh, or from open innovation and anything around uh, innovation, live innovation, uh, real-time innovation workshops, um, hackathons, uh, ideas management systems, um, which we are, would be very happy to uh, talk to you about. Uh, we have a global footprint and um, seen as a market leader um, <clears throat> and have some wonderful customers. If you come to the Q Market stand in the back, we'd love to talk to you more about these best practices or, of course, of our software. Let me show you this video. You've probably seen this. That's the last one. Okay, um, so much for that we truly believe in collaboration and in, in the uh, intelligence um, of, uh, uh, of the crowd. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Lucy, for, for uh, being here. I don't know, have we got one minute for a question? One or two minutes? If there's any in the audience, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Any questions from for either Lucy or Michael on their platform and the way they're implementing it? Yes. Uh, I have a question from Lucy and from a Um, it's a huge area that we need to tackle and we know that it's one of the areas that there's, there isn't a lot of innovation in there and how do you procure for innovation and innovatively procure and that's certainly an area that we want to focus now that we've got the platform in place it's been a journey to sort of get that in place but now to focus on that adoption piece and to look at how that can be done more effectively because otherwise we know that that's stifling the whole innovative approach within the health care sector essentially. I think it's a key it's a key element for anybody that's looking at open innovation make sure they've got a, a good way of in, um, uh, purchasing from smaller businesses yeah. that might not meet their normal criteria. Any any other questions in the audience? Yes, Bastian, there we go. Um, I found it quite interesting uh, how you engage with all the local uh, teams individually. Um, I was wondering how you address scale. So uh, by encouraging all the small local innovations, how do you in ensure that, that the great innovations are picked up and, and sort of rolled out nationally? So we meet as an AHSN network. So each of the 15 AHSNs get together. So we've got groups of commercial directors, improvement directors, and essentially what we do is, is look at, from, from our perspective locally, what could scale up our top three, and we've just done that piece of work where there are now um, a list of 45 innovations that we could scale across, and, and how do we make sure that we go to the areas that are most receptive first to get that sort of scale and, and then spread it more and support others in to deliver on that. Great. Um, there's a, we're going to have an open Q&A a bit later. Lucy, are you around later on today? I'm not involved. Oh, that's a shame. Well, Michael, are you yes. perhaps? So what we might be able to do is, is uh, have you back and answer a few more questions later on in the afternoon, if that's all right with you. Um, but in the meantime...